Hello, Hawken with Carlton Carnivores here again for another video uh, on carnivorous plants. Uh, in the last video that I made on Bra Brachinia reducta, I actually received a request for a particular topic, and I thought it was rather fortuitous as there's a, a rather very special plant that has decided to put on a show for me just recently. So the request was to cover Pinguicula, the butterworts. So these are a flypaper trap carnivore that is that are found uh, throughout the Americas and much of northern Europe and Asia. They come in several different uh, varieties, different groups. Uh, you have the northern temperate butterworts, which live across, of course, northern uh, North America, Europe, uh, northern Asia, uh, some of them down into the Himalayas or even uh, parts of the Atlas Mountains in northern Africa. These plants will go through their carnivorous stage during summer and then in winter form a dense uh, hibernaculum to survive the winter. You also have uh, annual or uh, specialized uh, Mediterranean species. There's the Southeast American temperate species which grow basically all year round and live alongside other carnivores like the Venus flytrap, uh, North American sundews, and American pitcher plants. There's the uh, South American highland and southern temperate butterworts, which grow kind of similar to the southeast U.S. species, but they often withstand much colder uh, alpine or nearly Antarctic temperatures in some cases. So uh, they actually develop uh, leaves that can tolerate uh, freezing, or at least very cold temperatures uh, buffered underneath the snow. And then there's the Mexican butterworts, which, of course, are found throughout Mexico and uh, Central America, often in the mountainous highlands. These guys are split up into two different groups, generally. You have the homophilus species, which tend to be either annuals or they live in very wet environments year-round, so they develop only the standard carnivorous leaves. And you also have the heterophyllous species, which develop carnivorous leaves, but then during the winter dry periods will develop either a succulent winter rosette or a true dormancy where they die back to a bulb underground and wait for more favorable weather. So the genus Pinguicula literally translates as little greasy ones because um, their leaves are covered in a, in a multitude of very small glandular tentacles, kind of like the uh, glands on sundews, but at a much smaller size. And so if you touch them, you get this dewy, almost greasy feeling uh, on your fingers. And that's what they use to capture their insects that they feed on. So the species that I want to focus on today is one of these uh, Mexican heterophila species known as Pinguicula lauiana. This is a very special species of butterwort because it's the only one in the genus that develops a red flower. Now in nature, red flowers are, or at least in uh, North and South America, red flowers, particularly those that have very long uh, nectar spurs, as you can see here, are often attractors of hummingbirds. And hummingbirds are often thought of as possibly one of the main pollinators of several different kinds of uh, butterwort. So these guys, uh, it's theorized, may be primarily pollinated by hummingbirds or uh, similar similarly sized species of hawk moths. Now, Pinguicula lauiana is found only in northern central Oaxaca in the Sierra Mix uh, Mountains. These guys live uh, anywhere from about 2,300 to 3,500 meters in elevation. That's more than six to 10,000 feet. And they live in pine oak or uh, montane cloud forests where during uh, the summer, it's often very wet, cloudy, misty all the time, and these guys live uh, often on rock faces where that cloud, that mist, and the rain that occurs there gathers and drips down, providing them with their uh, water, their, new, their needs for that, in order to, for them to produce their dewy, their succulent leaves. Excuse me. Now, in winter, of course, this area dries out, so while this species right now is showing uh, its carnivorous leaves in uh, cultivation, they don't always go through the same cycles as they do in uh, the wild. 
naturally in winter these guys will die back to a succulent phase where the leaves shrink down, they become very thick, kind of hairy, and overlap each other in this really tight, small rosette. And they sit in that uh, fashion until spring returns. And then spring is usually the period when they start to flower. So while mine are kind of on schedule for flowering period, they're kind of off with the growth uh, state that they should be in. So in summer they develop these beautiful, particularly this species, red-tinted rosettes of broad ovular leaves with the carnivorous uh, glands on them, while in winter they convert over to something that looks like this. Now this is a different species, but they develop very similar leaves that are smaller, more overlapping, and hairy, shingle-like, and help retain water so that the plant does not dry out. So. The Mexican butterworts as a whole are often considered among the easier species of carnivorous plant to grow for a number of different reasons. Uh, unlike other carnivorous plants, because these guys often grow in a very uh, mineral environment on rocks or in gypsum sands and so on, they're not so sensitive to the hard uh, minerals that other carnivores do not like in their water or their soil. So these guys can often more easily be watered with tap water or at least uh, they have to be flushed out less regularly. And because they often only use their roots as kind of an anchoring point, they can be grown in very small pots, as you can see here. So the roots often are only a few inches in length, and so you can plant them in a small pot, sometimes just only an inch or two deep, and that's all that they'll need. Many people will actually even drill small holes into like lava rock or pumice, and plant the butterworts in there, just because that rock will wick up water and the plants can anchor themselves on the, on the rocks with their short roots and they don't really need an actual soil in order to grow. Now more standardly, these guys tend to live, uh, or generally are grown, in some sort of relatively heavily mineral mix. So what I often use is a mix of perlite uh, sand or blasting abrasives, which are usually neutral and safe to use, and a little bit of peat just to hold a bit of moisture more easily in the pot. So usually a heavy amount of perlite and the sand, and just a bit of uh, peat. So once you have these guys established and growing, uh, they don't need a whole lot of water during summer. Uh, this species tends to be a little more forgiving of uh, watering also during winter when they're uh, in their succulent dry phase. But you want to keep them just damp most of the time. Wetter in summer, drier in winter of course if you can. And then you watch the plants and they will tell you what they want to do. Since these guys don't always follow the winter summer uh, cycles that you expect, uh, sometimes they will stay growing all through winter and so then you want to keep giving them water at that time and sometimes they'll decide they want to go dormant in the middle of summer and so you let them dry out then until they decide to start growing back their carnivorous leaves. They like a... these guys are tolerant to a lower amount of light than many other carnivores although if you give them a good amount of light uh, this species in particular will often develop a beautiful red hue as seen in the photo here where the uh, entire surface of the leaf, especially around the edges, will develop this rich red color. Other species may turn pinkish, or there's at least one cyclosecta that will actually turn purple. So grown in good light, uh, you want to feed them fairly regularly. They uh, prefer small pieces of food, so flies and gnats, or crushed up bloodworms, or fish flakes. Uh, dilute fertilizers such as maxi or certain orchid fertilizers often work really well and these guys will not absorb that fertilizer through the roots so it's best if you don't get it into the soil but if you do it's pretty easy to just flush it out especially if you grow them in small pots like this and they're fairly easy to propagate as well uh, the Mexican butterworts tend to prefer propagating via uh, late winter pullings of their winter rosette leaves and they'll sprout from that, but I often find success also taking pullings of the summer leaves. You can just pull those off. You want the base of the leaf as well when you pull those out. You just set that on the uh, soil surface or on some moist perlite and wait, and the base of the leaf will often start to bud after a few weeks. 
those can then be separated out and grown into new plants. Uh, most Mexican butterworts do not self-pollinate, so when they produce their beautiful blooms, uh, you have to have two different clones of the same species, typically, in order to pollinate them, or many people often create hybrids. With this plant here, I have already crossed this flower with Pinguicula gigantea in hopes to create a very large, uh, kind of red-tinted plant with flowers that hopefully will be beautiful and rich violet-purple color, since unfortunately these, this species doesn't often pass on its red coloration uh, to its hybrids, but it will often enrich the color uh, of the other species. Uh, back crosses, which are sometimes cap uh, possible with hybrids of this species, can sometimes develop more of that red color. But when you want to pollinate these guys, uh, the flowers are rather unusual in that they develop the stigma in sort of a bilobed fashion. So you have a tiny little lobe that folds upward and a larger lobe that folds downward. And behind that larger lower lobe is where the anthers, where the pollen is stored. So in order to get the pollen for these guys and pollinate it, you take something like a toothpick and you work it just underneath that stigma, grab the pollen, and then transfer it to the stigma of another flower. In this flower, the stigma is visible as this deep purple lobe right in the middle of the flower above the uh, nectar tube. So the pollen sits right behind that and it needs to be dragged out from behind there and applied onto the surface of the stigma, likely of another flower, in order to actually get successful pollination. Once you've done that, if you're successful with pollination, uh, sometimes a few days, sometimes a week later, the flower will eventually shrivel up and fall off, and the seed pod will then develop over time. You often won't know if you're successful until that seed pod actually opens up, because uh, in some cases they will develop a pod, but have nothing in it. If you're successful, that pod will open up and produce a whole bunch of little tiny brownish or blackish seeds that then just have to be sown on the soil surface. They don't require any sort of special treatment like uh, seeds of the northern temperate species might. They just need uh, good soil and a warm space to start growing. So that's all that I have for this species right now. If you guys have any other questions about this species, other butterworts, or if you want to have a focus video on other species of butterwort or other carnivorous plants, leave a comment down below. And of course, as always, to help uh, support videos like this and others, uh, you can visit Carlton Carnivores and find the plants and animals that are for sale there. Uh, you can support us on the Patreon account that we have. Uh, links will be down below for both of those sites. And you can find us also uh, on Facebook or Instagram at Carlton Carnivores. You can always ask questions, and if there's a topic that you'd like to see related to the carnivorous plants, other unusual plants, or some of the reptiles and other animals that we have here, feel free to leave us a message, and uh, I will try to figure something out and make a new video for you. So, until next time, this is Hawk and Carlton at Carl Carlton Carnivores. We'll see you then.